Great stuff. Thank you, guys, and uh, and welcome to this uh, panel discussion. Like Kefir said, we're just waiting for Roland, but uh, we can kick it off in any case uh, by introducing ourselves and at uh, at least. So my name is Karl de Acher. I'm from a company called the Blockchain Academy, and like the name says, we focus on uh, on quality education about blockchain technology. Um, we've been around for many years. I won't be surprised if we are the only academy focusing on the technology, on blockchain technology, at least left in in South Africa. That's where we're from. Um, and our customers are mostly corporates. Uh, and our training is therefore very business focused, uh, mostly focused on blockchain applications for industry, for business. So we tackle the technology on quite a high level. Myself, I uh, have an engineering background, so I like the technical stuff. I think Daniel as well. Um, but, you know, my job is to digest this technology and then present it on a much higher level. Uh, I will have, hopefully, two incredible guests joining me uh, for, for this discussion. So far, we only have one. Um, and we're going to talk about some really cool stuff in the prop tech industry, especially blockchain technology, which I'm really fa uh, passionate about. So, Daniel, I think I'll give you a minute. I, I was planning to give you 30 seconds, but let's make it a minute since Roland's not here uh, to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you. You've been around for a long time, um, one of the very early adopters of this technology. So tell us a, bit, a little bit about your background and then also about your company, CESO Global. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Block, and I'm the CEO of CESO Global. Uh, CESO is a one-stop shop for uh, property transactions and related property services. We're live in Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa. Uh, our product is a, a blockchain-powered uh, property registry system for developers, local governments, and property agents to manage their property records, their transactions, their leads, and then all of that to go on to our, our, our marketplace product where people can find properties and be assured that they've been verified and have the record of the, the documentation uh, stored by us on, the, uh, uh, on our blockchain. Uh, a bit about myself, uh, I'm from the U.S., uh, my background is, is really building uh, blockchain solutions. Um, I started out by, um, I had a very early Bitcoin exchange. We launched in 2011, one of the very early Bitcoin exchanges. I always say it kind of came and went, unfortunately, before most people uh, heard of Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, I did not end up with a Bitcoin millionaire, but I had to sell my coins off early. But uh, I then moved to Ghana. Uh, I had a grant project to work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, around um, building a, uh, a blockchain-based land registry with the Ghana Lands Commission. And we looked at different solutions, and we'll talk more about it, of potentially, you know, why blockchain is maybe not the best solution for the government's, uh, you know, uh, uh, sake uh, in building a, a, a land registry. And so we pivoted kind of more to a private sector to solution, which is what CESO is. It's a solution for developers, agents, and local governments to manage their registries and conduct transactions. So that's a bit about me and um, what we're up to at CESO. Cool. That's a that's an incredible, ambitious vision that you have there. Um, and, you know, like you said, if, if, if I hear blockchain technology and real estate, I just see major hurdles, major, major hurdles, especially regulatory. Um, so I would like to hear how you have overcome some of that. But, you know, before we get there, let's set the scene first. Um, you know, I think most people nowadays have heard it. I've at least heard about blockchain technology and what it is and what it entails. Uh, but unfortunately, the first interaction with it usually involves some scam uh, that someone might try to share to them. It's a very difficult term to grasp, you know, especially if you don't have a technical background. And you might be way worse off after you've done some Googling uh, and tried to, to go down the rabbit hole. I'm sure you've, all, you've also encountered that. So, um, Daniel, in your case, can you please explain to us what this technology is? You, 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 you've, you've described that you have um, gone quite deep in down the rabbit hole and you have quite a, a technical background and you've obviously been around in the real estate industry for some time now. So can you please ex try to explain it in a way that is relevant to, to the theme here, prop tech? Yeah, definitely. So... Um... Uh, and thanks, Kyle. Um, so in the very simplest end, when it comes to blockchain, and let's maybe say how it relates to property, but, you know, the blockchain, I always like to think about as the simplest base as a database. You know, it's really the next generation of databasing. You know, at first we had, uh, you know, pen and paper, then we had Excel, then we had cloud that was able to spread the documentation. And now we've moved from that to, to blockchain, which allows us to both 
decentralized and, and stored data um, in multiple places like the cloud. But more importantly, it, uh, it provides immutability such that anything on the blockchain cannot be uh, changed. You can update the transaction, but you can always see the past transaction. So blockchain really gives us that security that when we look at a database, how do we know that it's legit? How do we know what hasn't been changed on the back end? So blockchain really, you can think of it as a, a secure, immutable database that has a, a, a traceability of all the past transactions. And when we look at real estate, a few uh, examples. Well, I just want to touch there. I think you get that most people, is, like you said, think about crypto or think about these digital scams, but really. The Bitcoin and crypto is just one example that uses blockchain. So blockchain is the underlying database, you know, as we know, and really like we can store cryptos on the blockchain. We can also store land documents on the blockchain. We can also store, uh, you know, um, fractional ownership of properties uh, onto the blockchain. So when we look at the opportunity with real estate, you know, real estate has a lot of paperwork, uh, has a lot of documentation. And when we look at our use case, you know, what Sesso is trying to do is let people know that their property when they buy it from the Sesso platform is registerable. And I always like to think about that when we look at the land registry, people always think that this is what we need to do is register, you know, the government's land registry. But when we look at buying property and we look at um, when we look at buying property and we look at, you know, giving mortgages, the land title is really not enough. You know, an example I always use that we look at situations in Lagos where uh, properties have proper land title, but then they fall down, you know, they collapse if they're not built efficiently. We know examples where people have bought an apartment building on the fifth floor, go to register the title only to find out that they, uh, the building is only approved for three floors. So it's an unregisterable situation and nothing about the title uh, can, can, can tell you that. So at Sesso, what we're trying to do is look at like the, the overall picture. We're not trying to compete with the land registry. We're trying to um, expand the land registry to the documentation that, that doesn't exist with the government, the building uh, plans, the approved building reports, the conveyancing reports. Um, and so what we say is that when you, when you go onto Sesso, if you go to our platform, Sesso.global, you can find law firms, you can find valuers, you can find these uh, external service providers. And this documentation is key, you know, for the real estate uh, um, uh, industries, for when we're pricing, we're doing valuations, or when we're going to the, with the conveyancer to register. So really the aim of Sesso is to create um, a, a transactional platform where all of these um, documentations can be stored on the blockchain. So when I use the example that if I go to refinance my house after 10 years, I'm gonna do a mortgage and we look at a, a former architectural plan and the architect is dead, uh, the company is bankrupt, you know, how do we know that this piece of paper was a real building plan from 10 years ago? So putting these documentations on the blockchain can be sure that we're building long term. But I always like to say that the blockchain uh, stores data very effectively, but it doesn't verify data. The blockchain is not the end all be all. So we still need people on the ground to verify the documentation first, to verify the, the documents before they go onto the blockchain. And that's where it comes to the opportunity to uh, verify, you know, conveyancers, architects, to be using these blockchain systems to be building the documentation in a safe and secure way. Um, last thing I want to touch on is just tokenization, which we'll touch on more, but it's the same thing that if I want to know that I own maybe one hundredth or one fifth of a property, how do I, who, who is keeping that register of, uh, of, the, of the shared ownership? And this is where blockchain can really uh, enhance um, our, our record keeping around the additional documentation, you know, especially beyond the title. That's very interesting. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of points that you made, which I want to respond on uh, and have follow up questions on. But before we do that, uh, welcome, Dr. Roland Igbenoba. I hope I yeah, pronounced that correctly. Thank <laughs> and, you very uh, much. <laughs> yeah, I've been having a trying to um, have a bit of challenge going to the backstage. Yeah, but I'm here now. Yeah, thanks. And I've been listening on the conversation. How are you doing, Daniel? So, hey. How are you, Roland? Nice to hear. Yeah. Roland, can I please uh, ask you to introduce yourself and your company? Um, I, I presume that you are wearing the hat of the founder of the Nigerian Prop Tech Association today, um, but uh, I've noticed that you have quite a few hats which you can you can wear. So can you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, thank you very much, um, Karel. My name is uh, Dr. Roland Binoba. Like you rightly said, I've been involved over the last uh, two and a half years to organize the 
prop tech space in Nigeria. As you know, people like um, Daniel have been doing a lot of work in the space. And so uh, with a bit of my background, I'm into real estate development advisory, where typically I do work for um, government and multilateral um, companies. So over the last three years, with our research also into um, the property technology space, we realized that there is a lot happening. And today in Nigeria, you have over 80 uh, property technology startups. So at the Nigerian Prop Tech Association, what we are doing is to try and organize this startup in such a way that um, we can begin to attract a lot of attention, okay? Uh, uh, especially from um, seed capital investors and Series A investors. So that's, it. Uh, that's basically what we're doing in the Nigerian uh, prop tech space. Another interesting fact that has come up within the space is that as part of the work that we're doing uh, with, with prop tech in Nigeria, we are now matching traditional real estate companies to startups, you know, just to enable them incubate, you know, and then scale up their transactions. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Thanks, Dr. Roland. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, I just quickly want to want to get back to Daniel. Daniel, you described a lot of things that says so is trying to do, or hopefully it's doing already actually. And um, you know, one thing with regards to property, and definitely with regards to ownership, and and actually many other aspects of real estate is uh, that there's a lot of trust required in everything that we do. You know, we need to trust a centralized office that, uh, like you said, that the architectural plans are up to date and, and that they are following some sort of a regulation. And pro probably where the most trust is involved is uh, the transfer of ownership. You know, we typically buy t pay 10% of the asset value when we transfer that ownership from the buyer, from the seller to the buyer. Um, and it can take months. And that is definitely something which I'm quite fascinated about. Uh, um, that's a problem that, that uh, I'm quite fascinated about to solve through the use of tokenization. And you did touch on that. But um, my question with regards to that, you know, you also said that uh, blockchain is basically a super secure database. Um, but can't security also work against you? Like, let's say you have um, made an entry to this super secure database and you need to change that entry. You know, you need to perhaps uh, change an incorrect entry. Um, how do you manage to solve these kind of user related problems? Yeah, definitely. Um, great question. So, you know, that's, you know, one thing with to say blockchain with land registries, you know, people always look at is that if it is an immutable, unchangeable registry, you know, how do we, you know, uh, um, you know, account for mistakes and, you know, errors. And maybe I just want to touch on both like a use case in South Africa, both in, and we see in Nigeria as well. Um, you know, so if we look, especially, you know, uh, uh, Anglophone countries uh, across the world, you know, all of these countries have conveyancing laws. So we always say is that you're not, you know, legally, even though they're not always followed, you're not legally meant to go to the land registry yourself. They're supposed to be the conveyancer on the in-between that is taking the liability for that. Um, I, you know, I always use the example that if you do a land search in Ghana, at the Ghana land registry, at least up until two years ago, there's a disclaimer at the bottom that says, you know, this is the official report from the government. But if it's not correct, we're not liable. So even the government of Ghana is not going to give you liability that the title search you did on the land is correct. Um, and we look at also doing a, a pilot in, in, in Kailicha where, uh, you know, people were given RDP houses and weren't able to, um, uh, didn't do the primary transfer. So they don't have their deeds. And now the people have died. They've sold their houses. So there's multiple backlogs of transactions before they can solve, uh, 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 you know, uh, get the paperwork together to go to the, the deeds registry. So, you know, what, what, what we look at is that there needs to be uh, uh, the verifiers in the system. So we're trying to look at two ends. One, keep the government accountable by having, you know, a uh, record of the group. So if I pay a conveyancer to do my title registry, but we all we have is paper documents between us and we don't have, you know, a clear relationship of what was that done, how can I go back and hold that conveyancer liable? You know, if I don't have the, the proper records of my value or my architect. So what we see is that when we go to register title, you're generally going with a lot of knowledge. You know, I always say the title uh, registry is at the end of the process, not the beginning. So generally, you know, we need a lot of paperwork before we get to that. And when we do that, you know, these are professional organizations that we need to make sure that are doing their jobs correctly. So there's, I think, two ends to it. One, 
if we're using blockchain to record the 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 service providers, the surveyors, the valuers, the 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 lawyers, you know, we're building you know uh, trust and we're building you know verification. So we're on the blockchain. We're providing proof that these people have been paid and put their liability on the table to provide these reports. So you these can show where in the process it went wrong. On the other end, when we look at governments that potentially could change the registry or there might be internal corruption, you know, you can go back and say no. I I did do the, the registry correctly. I paid these there and I have these law firms and, and these, uh, you know, uh, organizations, you know, that should be in their best interest to help me, uh, you know, because it was the work that they did and it's their reputation on the line as well. I think what it is, is that we really can't focus on digitizing the government's registry. The government is a centralized organization. The government can change the registry at any point. You, know, you can have the documents on the blockchain, but what about when the government has eminent domain and takes the property? You know, so there's, there's no immutability in a government's land registry. Nothing's ever immutable. It can always be changed if there's a government project. So what we think when we think of blockchain, especially for the property space, is that we need to think of the real aspect of blockchain is, is, is bringing all the parties together, getting them onto a platform and keeping each party liable so that when I go to register, I have all the past documentation and can show, you know, who did that. So I think that as my as kind of my answer is that it needs a two way street of each party holding each other accountable. And if we have that record on the blockchain, you know, whether it's the the conveyancer holding the government land registry responsible, or then the, you know, the government, you know, you being able to hold responsible who did their work incorrectly, that having that record can, you know, do that. And if there needs to be a change, we can get the agreement by all of the parties. And if there is a mistake, we can change it, but show that everyone, the valuer, the surveyor, you know, whatever there's the mistake, we can show who made the mistake and who needs to update it rather than saying this just didn't work and the government's gonna um, you know, reverse the transaction. Cool. Thanks. I think I understand. It sounds like you are having you you have an identity layer on top of the blockchain, which uh, on which you can build a reputation, and then use uh, the trust factor um, with that reputation in order to make verifications. I'm I'm sorry about that rambling, but that that's that sounds more or less what you're doing, and that's fascinating. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Dr. Roland, um, you know on your Uniso connect video you talk about prop tech's influence on sustainable development goals by the way that's an excellent video i think uh, everyone should go and watch thank it you. Um, thank do, you do you think property technology can be a a catalyst for growth um on this continent oh absolutely L like i said now what has happened if i just think if i took nigeria for example right before now you cannot rent a uh, one bedroom, two bedroom on a yearly, on, on a monthly basis, okay? And so it has driven affordability of the roof. But with a few um, startups like Landlord's Technology, Split, um, Fiber, Rent, Small, what these guys have done is to break that challenge of people having to make an upfront payment for one year or two years rent. So now what you find is people are able to pay on a monthly basis. So rather than people living in the suburbs and traveling three to four hours to the city, you know, because of the price and accommodation, paying on a monthly basis enables them now to be able to live closer to work. And what does that do to sustainability? Okay, so we're talking about climate change. We're talking about emission of gas. In Lagos, as you know, for example, the traffic is enormous. So it takes about three hours to get from the suburb onto the city where you work. So Im imagine the emissions when you're traveling and when you're driving. So what these guys have done is to break down rent out on a monthly basis using um, technology. So this is increasing the growth in that space, in the rental space, in the market. So I'll tell you for sure, PropTech has the ability to grow the market. Now, the other thing I would love to talk about is um, crowdfunding. Now, we've seen we've seen crowdfunding in other sectors of the market in Nigeria, especially in the agri tech and in the agri business. But recently, um, it's been difficult for real estate to crowdfund because the regulations for real estate are very strict. But we are very excited because at the beginning of this year, the Securities and Exchange Commission have brought exposure drafts 
for crowdfunding in Nigeria. And so a lot of companies, especially traditional real estate firms, are now in the works preparing you know, uh, to, to work with the startup firms to crowdfund. Now, what does crowdfunding do? It's just like the real estate investment trust, but it's just that with crowdfunding, you have a lot more people, it is easier, and you can do this on the platform. So that's basically what's happening in the country at the moment. Interesting. Um, and like you said, uh, you know, with regards to crowdfunding, to me, I hear what I hear is that you're breaking down barriers to, to to entry into the into the property space, because I mean, funding is probably the biggest barrier to entry uh, for anyone looking to invest in real estate. Uh, it's 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 obviously a lot of money, uh, most more than what most people earn in a year to 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 buy a piece of real estate on average, and um, you know, crowdfunding definitely breaks down that barrier and enables anyone. In the world, actually, to 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 be part of the sector, um, but one thing that I do hear from both Daniel and Dr. Roland is that um, it sounds to me, if I can take a, a step back and 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 play devil's advocate here, it sounds to me like we we're adding a lot of complexity to solve problems. Is that true? Are we adding complexity? Are we making things easier? Or are we making things more difficult, especially to people without a technical background? Daniel, you earlier also mentioned that blockchain technology is not necessarily the right solution for every problem. Can you, we only have about uh, eight minutes left, eight minutes left. So can you take about two minutes if you can to explain why that? And then Dr. Roland, I'm gonna give you a chance to respond to that as well. Yeah, definitely. Um... So I was just saying in general, you know, I think what everything, what everyone's trying to do is is make the process easier. You know, if it's not easier and, and cheaper, you know, people won't go towards the solutions. And I think what tech does, of course, is a complexity of the product, but, you know, the, it's all about the user interface. So if it's easy for the user uh, and it's, it's more seamless, it doesn't matter what's going on in the back end. And this is on the touch on blockchain is that, you know, most people, it's like, you know, blockchain will be like the internet in the future. You know, most people will be using blockchain-led platforms, but not actually be aware of it because this is something that's running in the background and it's being used for either security or, you know, transferability and that. And so I feel like for everyone, if you don't understand, you know, the, the blockchain, who understands how like dial up, you know, how modems work, you know, most people don't get the internet. So, you know, I think it's not a, don't worry if that's the case. Um, and so, um, and would just say, um, as well as that, you know, when we look at blockchain, we look at any tech, it needs to, you know, come up with a concept. Does it make life easier for people? And does, you know, does it save them money or does it make them money? You know, there needs to be true incentives beyond the tech. And so I think, you know, everyone's, you know, trending towards the direction to make it easier. So whether it's, you know, crowdfunding that makes it easier for people to invest, or, you know, we're trying to assess so is give people more security when they buy, that they know their titles and, you know, properties will be registered efficiently uh, with, 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 with ease. Um, you know, the tech is all about, you know, trying to, Cool. Thank you. And yeah, that's that's actually one thing that uh, one goal that I also have within this the blockchain related industries. Uh, once we're at the point where no one knows they're using blockchain, then we know we've made it. We've been successful. Dr. Roland, yeah. what do you think? Uh, you think we're adding complexity? We're just making things more difficult, or or are we solving real problems? Yeah. See, so so it's it's one of the basics for for that I've always advised a lot of our clients I will work for to say that if there's not a problem that you're solving, then don't create, don't create anything, don't add to the problem. So I think PropTech is actually solving problems, okay? Like I just talked about increase, uh, having people having to pay one year rent, okay, for housing rather than paying on a monthly basis. And you must understand that the demographics that PropTech is serving is changing, okay? We're not serving the traditionalists. You're looking at generation X, Y, Z. And these are guys who are already very used to technology. But what they now want in addition to just using technology is to, 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 to have some sort of service and experience a, a, a good product. So it's about experiential uh, service. And these guys, these changing demographics are people who understand that tech is the way to go. So what PropTech is actually just doing is then helping them. So rather than a young um, employee, you know, or a young school leaver who just got a job paying one year rent, he can at least pay on a monthly basis. 
So we are solving problems. We are not adding to the complexities. Thank you. <laughs> cool, fascinating. Uh, I've also done a recording for you, Niso, and I hope the video will be will be up soon, where I actually also talked about the streaming of payments, not paying monthly, but paying per second or per minute or something in that sense. And I think uh, I think oh. that's a fascinating use case. Yes. Uh, for for everything that we do and even receiving your salary on a per second basis from the moment you open your laptop and perhaps your employer will start deducting when you when you open facebook you know <laughs> all right so to, to to finish off we only have a couple minutes left there's 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 two questions that i want to ask you guys um and you can maybe respond to both um in the same answer i want you to 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 paint a picture of the africa that you would like to see in terms of prop tech, um, and give us a few practical steps to get there. And, I, and, and then the second question relates to that. You know, blockchain technology always sounds so futuristic and it's so vague to many people. What can property experts out there and people in the real estate industry do today to already make use of this technology, except for going on to CESA Global and, and, and um, uh, registering themselves there? What other ways can they do to interact with the technology and, and, and make use of what we have out there today already? Yeah, um, I go. Um, so um, I guess on the, um, the the second one, you know, what's what's out there? Oh, and I guess we'll start with the first one. So, you know, what we really think, I think it's maybe say like, what is a big opportunity that we would like to see uh, capitalize on the next three to five years is, you know, if we look at the remittances to Africa, uh, in 2018, it was at 45 billion a year, and uh, the uh, Commonwealth uh, Foundation did a, a report and said around 30 percent of that either goes to real estate or those people would like to go, have it go into real estate. So we look at that volume. You know, that is a huge, huge amount. You know, that uh, is for many countries is greater than the uh, the foreign direct investment foreign aid. So what we would like to see is you know more seamless processes to bring in you know turn remittances into investments and you know as we said you know, africa is the most arable land not even when we're looking at residential or commercial you know farmland there's so much you know uh, uh opportunity to grow develop population growing so once we can you know move money simply you know and there's products to do this whether it's crowdfunding whether it's secure transactions like with seso whether it's you know rentals and that m moving you know money from low yielding markets to high yielding markets and i think we will see a boom and what i'd also love to see you know beyond south africa you know we don't see many developers listed on the stock exchange you know being international being some of the biggest companies in the world nigeria you know i feel that many developers are you know smaller time and they're doing project by project you know when capital increases it'll be great to see you know you know some of you know, the african developers being leaders in the world you know coming to other countries to build you know solutions based on the success and the capital being allowing uh, in the industry i think on the blockchain side you know there's a lot that can be done right now and I, and I think it needs to see like what the developer wants as roland talked about crowdfunding there's more and more blockchain crowdfunding platforms coming out uh we always say with the crowdfunding you need to be sure that you can provide the yield that you promise or maybe the crowdfunding platform won't be around too long um and so you know the other things would be is you know accept bitcoin accept ethereum there's people out there that potentially would want to buy property you can convert your crypto instantly to us dollars or czar or whatever currency you want so if people want to pay you know take it yeah crypto yeah that's such excellent advice thank you man uh, it's uh, it's that's that's brilliant and uh and you said it, it levels the playing field you know, with the, the, the permissionless nature of, of blockchain technology allows everyone to be exactly treated exactly the same. It does not discriminate on social class or any other attribute. And, um, you know, there's no bureaucracy by nature that you cannot build bureaucracy into a blockchain system. That's excellent, excellent advice to you. And I like the payments one, accept Bitcoin, accept Ethereum. I mean, that's something you can do in half an hour. Build it, build a checkout in your in your website that accepts that, and half an hour later you have that, and you are really interacting with the technology probably um, as much as you can. Thanks, thanks Daniel for that uh, advice, Doctor Roland. Okay, I think the way I want to look at this is to look at this from a policy and regulatory perspective. I think the private sector is doing a, a, a lot in terms of blockchain technology, but something that we shouldn't miss is that government still has the roots to title 
Okay, so no matter the no matter the immutability that we think blockchain has, government still has the roots to title. So we must try as much as possible to win governments over. I think across the region we haven't done that very well, you know, because it, with blockchain technology, it's going to rest on the root of the title, and government needs to be connected to a lot of this infrastructure that the private sector is working up. And so, and that's and that's where I have a bit of concern in terms of blockchain technology. I'll tell you, a lot of private companies are already doing blockchain technology in their various services, not just in real estate, okay? Because at the back end, just like Daniel mentioned, you, you are doing a transaction and you don't know whether there's blockchain happening at the back end. But every time of that transaction, there's a timestamp. Whatever process you've gone through, there's a timestamp. And that is blockchain. But you see, it must be connected to the infrastructure of the municipalities in such a way that the authenticity of the title is guaranteed. And if governments are still re uh, reluctant in getting onto the blockchain technology, then I think we'll have a problem that we need to deal with. So that would be my take to look at this from the policy um, perspective and regulation, policy and, and regulation by government. So much, Dr. Roland, and it's so true what you are saying. As much as we know that our technology is is can change the world forever um you know when you when it interacts with a industry such as real estate the the real world um is applicable and we need to you know um use real world um, industries and real world role players uh, in order to get that done and and that's where the probably the biggest barrier is guys i thank you you guys have been excellent um it's a, it was so short unfortunately and there's so much to be said so i do invite all of the attendees to to connect with us after the session and uh, let's keep the conversation going thank you so much guys